Looks like a new Goblin Slayer is in town. His name is Kirito. So what's up guys, Foxman here. This week on SAO Elicization, Kirito and Yuji vs the Goblin Army. And yes, I've seen some of you that weren't a fan of Yuji being made to seem like a dumbass by yelling out. But come on, they were scary muscle green guys. By the way, the cuts and changes video for episode 3 is now up. Anyway, it's showtime. At the beginning of this episode, Yujiro was super freaking out some more. It almost seemed like a panic attack. So they definitely made Yujiro to be more of a scaredy cat in the anime. And not that I could blame him going up against an army of these green bastards. No offense to other green folks or guys. And yes, about these goblins, also known as monsters from the dark territory. Unsurprisingly, these dark type monsters are afraid of the light. Oh, it burns. But what the hell, are they like vampires? I mean, they were fine with fire. Better start using some holy sacred arts, Yujiro. Oh yeah, what was that about them having no weapons? They didn't bring the axe, but this crystal cave is a freaking treasure trove of loot. New weapons all around this crystal dump. Too bad for them, no shields. As for Kirito vs the goblin leader, oh yes, that smooth animation. And it looks like even though Kirito started from level 0, it seems that he's kept some of his battle experience from other VR worlds. At the beginning, it seemed like he was struggling. Then Kirito seemed to be flying past those weak green mofos. And I just love seeing Kirito use a couple of sword skills. And about that. So all of Aincrat's skills do seem to exist in the underworld. Kirito here was using single sword skill ones. Come on Kirito, you should have really grabbed two freaking blades. There's so many of them. It was interesting to see how Kirito seemed to match up with the Goblin Leader with strength, since you saw him taking on that Sword Slash. The question is, was this Goblin dude not being serious? So that's what you get for underestimating Kirito with his chopped arm. Time to barbecue some lizard meat. By the way, I do appreciate how they were not holding back on the blood. The Goblin here was like a blood fountain. And I yes, freaking blood. Which is unlike the old Aincrad. Looks like SAO Lizization took Attack on Titan's blood budget. And yes, do keep in mind the underworld may be a VR world, but it's definitely not some game. That being said, Kirito was definitely not going to be getting out of this without a few scratches. Youch. So here's a bit of an extra detail. Unlike games like SAO or Alpha and Online, in the underworld there's no pain absorbers. This means you feel every inch of pain as if it were real life. But actually, it's even worse. What makes any damage more painful is that yourself in the underworld could last a lot longer alive compared to a real life human. Which means, you're gonna feel a lot more pain when engaged in the death battle. In real life, you would just die way sooner or be knocked out compared to the underworld. As for blonde boy Yujiro to the rescue, almost surprising to see how dedicated Yujiro was to holding onto that light source. It did help out a ton though. What was surprising to see, or perhaps Yujiro just got lucky, is that the goblin leaders did not slice his body in two with that slash. I think he could have easily done so. By the way, I also just like how the little goblins here weren't even trying to help their almighty leader as he was going up against Kirito and Yujiro. Thanks guys. Now, as for Yujiro dying, something very interesting happened here. At the point of Yujiro dying, bleeding out, Yujiro actually spoke about the time in the past with Kirito and Alice. Notably, their bond together, even being born closely to one another. Keep in mind that beforehand in the village, no one seemed to recall Kirito, especially not Yujiro. So, was Yujiro's memory getting a much needed reminder from that blood loss? Hmm. And even afterwards, you have Kirito revisiting by asking Yujiro this directly. Even so, interesting to see that Yujiro still remembered. Yujiro recalled both what he mentioned and that vivid memory. Although he still doesn't think that was Kirito, since Kirito wasn't born there. However, Yujiro still feels like he's been waiting for Kirito for 60 years. So getting those long lost memories back. The key thing still remains of why things are in the state for the underworld right now. Anyway, as for Kirito getting his second win from Yujiro being taken out. Freaking savage Kirito too with that decapitation. Damn it Kirito, frightening the little kid goblins away. By the way, let me mention something here that you should be aware of. It's a slight complaint, or rather, not too much of a complaint, but something worth mentioning as someone who's read all the light novels for SAO Elicization. So far, it seems like they're heavily cutting down on a lot of the internal conflict and thoughts from characters like Yujiro and Kirito, especially Kirito. So far, that's fine for now, although I am a bit worried about future events to come. Some of the later stuff that's coming that's even more deeply impactful really comes from knowing these internal thoughts. I don't know if replacing most of this with visuals and voice and animation will help make up for it, but we'll see. 
A very good example of this should have been the battle between Kirito and the Goblin Chief. For one, it almost seemed too quick in the anime, although battle scenes always are. Then Kirito also did get slashed, but seemed to quickly shake that damage off. In the novel, it actually lets you know of Kirito's internal conflict and fear when battling this artificial fluck-like being, who's not necessarily human. On top of this, you got to know much more about the pain that Kirito was going through when he got slashed. It definitely felt like much more of a struggle, like a life and death battle, compared to the anime. I'll definitely touch on this more on the changes video in a few days. Anyway, as for Selka's high level sacred arts, literally transferring the life from one person to the other, or from two people. I don't know, but this just seems scary if this could be done forcefully by an enemy. Or forget the enemy, how about the church, guys? Funny enough, this actually reminded me of Kazuma doing something similar with Aqua and Megumin. Although, that was just mana, which is kind of like life in a way. Oh, and let me not forget about that weird vision or hallucination that Kirito witnessed. Selka definitely didn't see that, and Yujiro was knocked out. Although really, from the blonde hair and voice, dead giveaway that that was Alice. You got young Alice encouraging them to go to the central city, aka the place where the Axiom Church lies. But why did Kirito see this now? Was it due to Selka using this high level sacred arts? On top of that, one which drains life. Gotta get more of that high level art stuff. That is some good stuff right there. Just don't tell the Axiom Church about it. Anyway, next day, Yujiro thankfully back to tip top health. The underworld may be more painful, but at least you got some sacred art magic that'll heal you back up to 100%. More importantly, Kirito trying out the Blue Rose Sword. Turns out that his object authority is not enough to use a Blue Rose Sword. So hey, those green bastards did turn out to be XP bags after all. And just think about it, these guys who never fought anything like giant frogs or goblins should have been at level 1. In other words, that should have been some massive power leveling from that goblin chief kill. Even better is that unlike Konosuba, the underworld seems to have some actual XP sharing from your party members. Anyway, the important part here is that both Kirito and Yujiro's object authority is now enough to use the Blue Rose Sword. So something else to think about here. The Blue Rose Sword was previously very hard to use, which was barely equipable. After only one battle, Kirito and Yujiro could wield it no problem. Did they really get that much XP and level up a good chunk from the goblin leader battle? Or are all regular citizens that close in status to using divine objects like the Blue Rose Sword? I guess I gotta give Yujo some credit. He does have some other experience from being a woodchopper for years. Next up, let's talk about Yujo the Swordsman Apprentice. You get Yujo gaining some massive confidence and determination boost now that he's fully able to use the Blue Rose Sword. Now it's time to find one for Kirito too. And yes, Kirito. The student from Aincrad has become the swordsman teacher. Makes for a pretty natural progression, just taking on that Kakashi role. It was even complete with his sword training montage, although a pretty brief one. I just love how Kirito named his skills after the Aincrad style. Very nice callback to the previous SAO. And by the way, there are going to be continuous callbacks to all the past seasons and events. SAO elicitation does build on everything that the SAO characters have experienced up until the Underworld. Next up, the demon Gigas tree finally chopped down. I bet you some of the past woodchoppers are feeling really bad about now. Should've tried leveling up first. Naturally, Yuju did pick swordsman for his next sacred task. Screw you guys, I'm leaving this dump with my best buddy Kirito. As for Selka and Kirito's conversation, here's something interesting about this little troublemaker. Oh, I wasn't trying to be like my sister Alice at all, I just wanted to be closer to her. Guess what Selka? The capital is in the complete opposite direction. Although to be fair, stepping into the dark territory would have given you a one-way ticket there. But being serious, even Kirito here wasn't really giving her that great of advice, which was doubling down on how much of a great thing it was regarding what she did. But do keep in mind, Selka, we're not going to be here to save you next time. That being said, I do like Selka's progression of not living in her sister's shadow anymore, even though she did put herself in that position to some extent. She's not meant to be some Alice replacement. One of the weird things I found that they cut out here was no mention of Selka getting better with the sacred arts. Selka was supposed to be part of that XP share party. As for Selka and Yujo's last talk together, you got Yujo trying to fix some wounds before taking off, also doubling down on Alice being alive somewhere. Oh Yujo, even now Yujo still feels responsible for what happened with Alice all those years back, and it's only something that he could fix. Come on, take some blame off. At least blame Kirito for part of it, or most of it. It was his idea in the first place to get some ice. Alice then found a loophole to agree with him. Then nearby, you have stalker Kirito listening to Yujo's promise, which really reminded me of a Kakashi moment. Either way, time to go defeat the Demon King and climb the tower to rescue Rukia, I mean Alice, 
As for the ending of this episode, off to their adventure they go. This is really giving me a vibe of Full Metal Alchemist. The two brothers taking off from their home. In this case, the two best buddies here. There was something surprising that they didn't show, and they'll definitely have to flash back to it later. So super minor spoiler, you see that long wrapped up package that Kirito is carrying on his back? That's actually the top branch of the Colossal Gigas Tree. The previous woodchopper before Yujo told Kirito to take it with him. And the next episode titled The Ocean Turtle. So in case you've been completely in the dark with what's going on with Kirito in the underworld, and the status of Asuna in real life, the next episode is going to answer everything. Next up, let's talk about this episode's animation. During that battle, you saw a ton of blood when Kirito got slashed by the goblin leader. Then a few moments later when Kirito got pushed down, no blood in sight. And then no blood afterwards. So, a possible animation mistake or was it on purpose? Also in general for this episode, I'm not going to go into extreme detail, but I did notice more than a few lower quality shots or still images conveniently used. I'll be fair, I'm going to completely forgive them as long as the later stuff is top quality. And yes, the standout scene for this episode, Kirito vs the Chief Goblin. That sweet, sweet animation. I'm just loving the fact that so much care is being put into SAO by the A1 studio. I could only get even more hype for future upcoming battles if they're all going to be like this. The second half of Velicization is going to be almost non-stop battles. And besides the actual fight, I really do appreciate seeing the improved source skills here. There's really a world of difference between the Velicization animation compared to the SAO Season 1 stuff. Pretty much no comparison. Here's hoping that SAO Progressive eventually becomes a thing. By the way, keep in mind that the changes video for episode 3 of SAO Elicization is now up. All the cut stuff for the first and second episode is also up now. I'm getting back into my schedule, so changes video for episode 4 coming in a day or two. By the way, for another upcoming SAO Season 3 video, I did mention being a little behind schedule, and I am working on the SAO Elicization opening breakdown. That's coming this week. But anyway, more important, let me hear from you now. Question of the day. What did you think of Kirito and Yujiro versus the Goblin Leader fight? Did it seem too easy, or was it a nice challenge? And how awesome was that animation? If you have read the light novels, did you have any issues or highlights for this episode? Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, smash that thumbs up and subscribe. If you're new to the channel, I put out 5 plus anime videos here every week. That now includes weekly SAO videos. The video covering stuff you missed for episode 3 just went up a couple of days ago. Definitely check that out. And don't forget, weekly Attack on Titan videos too. So, hit bell notifications, subscribe, and I'll see you guys later.